Hello and welcome to Vibrant Lives Podcast, formerly Amanda's Wellbeing Podcast. This is a podcast dedicated to health and well-being, featuring interviews with experts in the fields of nutrition, physical and mental health, and my five-minute food fact series. I'm Amanda Hayes, your host, a lawyer turned nutritionist. I'm very passionate about learning how to live a vibrant life through practicing mindfulness and meditation, eating a nourishing healthy diet and moving my body and sharing what I learn with you here on this podcast. Please note that any information or advice provided in Vibrant Life's podcast is not intended to be used to treat injuries or medical conditions and it's never a substitute for advice from your own health professionals. Today I am here with Dr. Martin Gabala. Martin is a professor at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, and he also currently serves as the chair of the Department of Kinesiology there. Martin is an integrative physiologist who studies the mechanistic basis of exercise responses in humans and associated health impacts. He's pioneered research on the topic of interval training, including high-intensity interval training, otherwise known as HIT. And through that research, he's helped establish the efficacy of brief, intense exercise to enhance physical fitness in both healthy individuals and people with chronic disease. In addition to that, he's also co-authored a book on the science of time-efficient exercise. It's called The One-Minute Workout, Science Shows a Way to Get Fit That's Smarter, Faster and Stronger. So we will discuss that in this episode, and I'm really looking forward to sharing with you everything that Martin has to say about high-intensity interval training. Hi, Martin. Welcome to Vibrant Lives podcast. Thanks for having me. Uh, It's my pleasure. So Martin, I always like to start my discussion getting to know a little bit about my guests. So I thought a good way to do that would be to have some quick fire questions. So where did you grow up? I grew up in Windsor, Ontario, which is the southernmost city in Canada across from Detroit, Michigan. Right. Must get pretty cold in winter, I expect. Uh, It does, although being one of the most southern cities, it's not as cold as some of the other parts. No, the north would be colder. That's right. I'm just thinking that because it's winter here and I'm thinking it must be so cold in Canada in a winter compared to what I think is cold here. Anyway, sorry, on with my questions. What were your favorite sports growing up? I did a range of different sports, a lot of uh, American football and uh, baseball. And then uh, I got into uh, triathlon in my uh, Mm -hmm. high school and collegiate time. Excellent. And what are your favorite sports teams that you support? Growing up across from Detroit, Michigan, I supported the Detroit Tigers and the Detroit Red Wings. Uh, But Mm -hmm. now, of course, living closer to Toronto, I've become more of a a, a Leaf and Blue Jay fans, although that's challenging at times. Right. (laughs) Yeah, I must admit, we went to watch a Blue Jays game in 2016 in Toronto, and it was the first baseball match I'd ever seen. And it was so exciting to me. It was just fascinating to watch the whole thing unfold. And that was yeah. probably a good time to be there because they were uh, in a pennant race, if I recall, around that time and have since stumbled a little bit. Oh, is that right? What is your favorite local, in other words, Canadian food? Well, I, I won't say poutine or maple syrup or one of those <laughs> cliches, but uh, we, you know, living near the Great Lakes, we we have a lot of uh, local uh, fish, and so mm-hmm. pickerel and some of the other local catches are uh, are quite quite excellent. Mm-hmm. What's a pickerel like? Is it a big fish, a small fish? It it, it is, and it's a it's a it's a white fish, not too fishy, if if you mm-hmm. will. Yeah. Um, yeah. What about Tim Bits, Tim Hortons? Are you a fan of those? There's pretty much one on every corner, so it's it's hard not yeah. to be a Tim Hortons uh, fan uh, living around where we do. Yeah, they're everywhere in Canada, aren't they? And Martin, when you're not working or exercising, what do you like to do? Yeah, I, I, I like to read, ideally not scientific journal articles. I'm mm-hmm. making more of an effort to uh, to read, and uh, and I do like to, uh, to cook, uh, so that fills up uh, much of my time. Oh, that sounds great. So, Martin, today you're a professor of kinesiology at McMaster University in Ontario, Canada. Can you explain to us, in the context of what you do, the meaning of the term kinesiology? Yeah, so kinesiology is simply the scientific study of human movement, and Mm -hmm. that, of course, ranges from basic physiology to 
neuroscience, mental health, uh, workplace injuries. So it's, it's a very broad interdisciplinary field. Right, I see. And I just wanted you to explain that because just to clarify, in Australia, the, the term kinesiology can have a different connotation. It's, um, it's often used in the context of complementary medicine, where it looks at sort of a muscle monitoring and working out if there are imbalances in the body. And it's more of a study of energy, as in chi, as opposed to a, a medical study. So that's just a difference I thought was worth highlighting over in canada physi um kinesiology also is recognized as a profession although that's a more mm. recent development and it would be along a similar lines but closer to complementing physiotherapy occupational uh therapy so right. we like to think of it as both a discipline and a profession mm -hmm. which is a narrow narrow slice of it right so someone can go off and see kinesiologist over there yeah Correct. Uh, they can they can hear, but it sounds like they might practice in slightly different ways. So, Martin, you examine um, your research examines the physiological basis of exercise responses in humans and the impact on health and performance. What was it that drew you to that area of study and research? Being active in in my youth, and ideally still staying active today, but I, I was drawn to the field. I actually, out of high school, I was accepted into architecture school and was planning mm -hmm. to go. And then I had a high school uh, physical education teacher who really opened my eyes to the area of kinesiology. And I opted at the last minute to switch and start to study that in university. And then it was a second year course in human physiology that really caught my attention. And from there, I, I just specialized more and more. And what fascinated me was having an understanding, sort of that mechanistic insight mm -hmm. of, of why exercise, physical activity made you better at that time as an athlete, but of course now mm -hmm. uh, more broadly, why it is so effective for our health. Yeah. And that's a good um, segue into the next set of questions I want to ask you, which are about fitness in general, so in a general sense, why is it important to be fit? Why does fitness matter? Yeah, well, quite simply, it's going to lower your risk of dying from all causes, and it's going to lower your risk of developing many different chronic conditions, uh, cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, uh, even dementia, and certain types of, of cancer. So uh, that's probably the strongest uh, evidence that I could uh, provide. Well, that does sound like pretty compelling evidence, I've got to say. Um, and what are the different types, or broadly speaking, that is, of fitness? There are sort of two main types. Yeah, well, if you look, of course, at public health guidelines, they're generally recommending some sort of cardio or endurance type exercise to promote cardiorespiratory fitness. We can define that mm -hmm. term and get into it, but it's broadly the capacity of your heart, your lungs, your blood vessels to pump blood and oxygen through the body. And of course, uh, strength is an important component as well. Increasingly as, as we age, particularly lower body strength, or you know, you'll, you hear this term functional fitness, are, are you strong enough to do activities of daily living uh, that allow you to live a, 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 you know, a fulfilling uh, life? And of course, that extends into other areas, flexibility, uh, mental uh, health and well-being, but cardiovascular and strength would be the two primary components. So for most people then, the recommendations would be to do some of each? Yes. Yeah, so uh, here in Canada, they broadly align with the World Health Organization. I know mm -hmm. it's similar in Australia. Generally, 150 minutes per week of moderate to vigorous aerobic physical activity. Uh, that's two and a half hours. It sounds like a lot to people, but it's really only about 4% of your time in a week. So it's not that daunting in some respects. Uh, and regular strength training and the, often the recommendation is um, activities uh, at least twice a week in that respect. Right. And we're learning more and more how important it is to maintain strength as we age. I think you have mentioned a test that can be done uh, uh, to test strength, which is a sitting or squatting yeah. So, you know, when we hear strength, many people think that means having to go to the gym and lift heavy weights. And of course that can be effective, but simple body weight style movements, which anyone can do at home, it doesn't require mm. much space and no specialized equipment. So we're talking a series 
uh, of air squats uh, or wall sits where you're sitting against a wall and perhaps trying to hold that position for 10 minutes. That's going to develop strength in, in the lower body um, muscles, uh, your glutes, your butt muscle and your, and your, your quadriceps, the large muscles in, in your legs. And why that's so important from a functional perspective is frankly, it allows you to get off the toilet unassisted. Yeah. And so that's one of the predictors of, of whether someone will require assisted living is, of course, can they um, use the toilet on their own? Mm. Yeah, so it's, it's really important to maintain that strength, obviously, for independence as we age. You've explained briefly why cardiovascular and strength fitness is good for us, but how does a person know if they're fit enough? It's a great question. So in, in, in some respects, I come back to this idea of can you go through the activities of daily living that you like and enjoy? So, you know, if the lift or the elevator was out at your building or your work and you had to climb three flights of stairs, could you do that without getting unnecessarily winded or with that, you know, mm -hmm. take the wind out of your sails for an hour or so? You know, can you play with your grandchildren? But we should have an idea of our fitness, just like we do our blood pressure or our pulse rate. And so there are some very good online calculators. We could put one in the show notes after sure. uh, that's been validated against very good science. And so it will give you a, a pretty good estimate of your fitness and allow you to put it in context rather to, relative to others uh, of your age and biological sex, uh, for example. Uh, there's some submaximal, simple submaximal tests that people can do where you might step up and down on a single step and then measure your, your submaximal heart rate. That's a good indicator. Or of course, you could do effectively an exercise stress test. And that's something that mm -hmm. we would do in the laboratory, uh, known as a VO2 max test, which is yeah. uh, what, what athletes are often interested in. Mm. But you're saying there are tests that people can do at home without needing this um, lab equipment. Absolutely. And, and even if the test is not perfectly valid or accurate for you, yeah. I think it gives you a, a stake in the ground or a marker and allows you then to monitor yourself over time. So six months later, if you do the test again, is yeah. your number staying the same? Has it crept up a little bit or is it is it sinking and especially sinking to a level that, that might you put you at significant risk of some of these chronic diseases that we were talking about? So let's assume that someone's done a test at home and they've thought to themselves, okay, I would like to be fitter. And let's talk about some of the things that we can do to address that. And specifically, I'd like to talk about your area of expertise, which is interval training. And you're, you're well known for your work in the area of high intensity interval training. And you've written a book on the topic too, which we will come to. But if you could explain to us first, what is high intensity interval training and give us some examples of some exercises people could do yeah so it's quite simply alternating periods of more intense effort and recovery so you can think of going hard backing off taking a break and repeating that pattern so for an individual it might be as simple as if your only exercise is walking around the block at night with your partner or your pet you could pick up the pace for a few light posts just subjectively you feel your heart rate maybe a little higher it's a little harder to talk to your partner if you're having a conversation and then backing off that's a very simple example of interval training that almost anyone uh, could do uh, and of course scaling it up any serious endurance athlete yeah. utilizes interval training and of course the prescription there is very precise in terms of target heart rates or zones that they might be working in but people here hit or high intensity interval training they think that it's only for very fit people or elite athletes and and that's certainly not the case yeah and elite athletes have a lot of metrics that they're looking at like you mentioned heart rate and various things for, but for people that don't have access to that and they want to, um, they think, okay, I've heard about HIT. It sounds really good. It's going to get me nice and fit. Can you explain to us in the high intensity part, how hard should that be relative to the rest part? Yeah. And so here you can use something as simple as a zero to 10 scale. And so, for example, in my book, I try to give a few examples of, of sample workouts 
uh, scaled to this zero to 10. So it's, it's really what we're talking about there are ratings of perceived exertion. So just your self sense mm -hmm. of how hard you might be working. And you can imagine that one is lying on the couch or watching television. And 10 is that sprint from danger pace or the pace you would run at to save your child from an oncoming car. And so typical moderate intensity exercise is a three or a four. And so mm -hmm. a five or a six, which is subjectively rated as hard or vigorous, uh, you can work at a five or six out of 10. Uh, and you might carry that on for maybe three minutes and then back off. And of course, as you move up the scale, the intensity goes up and the amount of time required that you're able to sustain uh, goes down. So you might do 20 second, very vigorous workouts at, a, at an eight or nine um, pace. But that, that idea of a zero to 10 scale allows someone to individualize the sense uh, of, uh, of effort. And importantly mm -hmm. there, people need to understand or realize it's, it's not only zero or 10. So some people think right. it is only yeah. this sprint from danger pace. No, there's a, there's a wide spectrum there of relative intensities that can be effective. Yeah. And that's good to hear actually, because it would be a bit off-putting if you thought you had to <laughs> sprint from danger every time. If someone is doing a, a hit workout, how long should they do it for? Yeah. And again, it, it depends uh, on, you know, what I mean by that is it depends a little bit on your goals and why you're doing it and what type of interval training might appeal to you. You know, these short, mm. crisp workouts uh, or, or that, um, you know, interval walking analogy that I used uh, earlier. Uh, you know, first, ideally, people should strive to meet the public health guidelines, which is this 150 minutes a, a week or so. Many people, of course, cite time as a, as a major obstacle or barrier there. And yeah. so I, I would say, anything is better than nothing, uh, not to yeah. be too glib or trite. And the uh, most of the major public health organizations around the world have recently eliminated a previous requirement that said bouts of activity had to last at least 10 minutes in, in duration. And I think it was partly in recognition of some of the evidence for mm. these very short interval style workouts, you know, we're talking 20, 30 seconds at a time repeated a, a, a few times. So in terms of uh, minimum duration, I, I think there really is none. And, you know, this opens up this idea of exercise snacks, which are these yeah. very brief uh, bouts of activity uh, spread through the day. And the last point I'll make is that going from that completely sedentary state to just the next level of fitness. So just boosting your fitness a little bit has tremendous bang for your buck. So the risk reduction, the relative risk reduction, when you go from completely sedentary to just moving around a little bit is quite pronounced. And then it, it builds over time, but there's points of diminishing returns, if you will. Right. You mentioned exercise snack, and I really love that term. And let's delve into that a little bit, because what you're saying, I believe, is that doing small exercise snacks is better than doing nothing at all. So let's think about some ideas that people could, for example, do if they're at work. Um, one thing I thought of was perhaps while you're in between phone calls, you could go and walk up and down or run even up and down the stairwell, um, something like that. Absolutely. That's a great example. You know, as we're both having this interview, I know we're both uh, sitting at desks. Uh, we, we could uh, stand up from our desks and do a series of air squats or those wall sits that I mentioned before. Um you know, my, one of my personal favorite exercises, it's very challenging, but it's a, it's a burpee exercise. Oh. That would be another <laughs> example, but any sort of body weight style uh, workout or exercise can be effective here. If you happen to have a stationary bike, jump on that. Or as you say, mm -hmm. if you're have access to a stairwell or even just running in place or marching in place, these old style high school or school aged physical education class calisthenics are very effective. Mm. And what I really like about the whole concept is that it really removes that barrier that exercise has to be done in a certain way, wearing certain clothes for a certain duration of time. And that can be, as I said, it's a barrier because you might think, well, oh, I don't have time to put on my fancy lycra and go to the gym and do a class, so I'll do nothing. But what I'm hearing loud and clear is no, that's okay. You can do little bouts of five minutes throughout the day, and that is going to be beneficial. You're right. And perhaps a better term is actually activity snacks, because we're really just mm. talking about physical activity. You know, yeah. exercise precisely defined is a component of physical activity and incorporates those elements that you alluded to, planned, structured, whereas physical activity 
is much more, uh, it's a much broader term. And so if we remove even that term exercise for some people is a barrier. And so if we yeah. just say people, no, we're just saying, be active a little bit more, get up and move, you know, these simple mm -hmm. messages, uh, it, they, they, they really do count and these movements spread throughout the day, just getting a little bit more, it, it really does pay benefits. And there are so many ways we can do that. Even just, um, you know, if we put the kettle on and walk up and down the hallway instead of standing and waiting for it to boil, for example. I think it's probably something that we need to change our mindset a bit. And as you say, um, activity snacks, just keeping ourselves moving. Absolutely. I'm actually involved with some collaborative research led out of the University of Sydney by an individual named Emmanuel Stematakis, who's looking at this idea of vigorous intensity lifestyle physical activity. And so what that means is as you're going about your activities of daily living, or you're playing with your children, or you're walking to the bus or the subway to go to work, pick up the pace a little bit, you know, just try and get huff and puff a little bit, get into that <laughs> vigorous intensity zone, even if it's brief, and it doesn't have to be planned or especially structured throughout your day. I'm laughing a bit to myself because I'm imagining shopping at the supermarket and running around with your trolley, <laughs> making that your, your little activity snack. <laughs> I, I talk about this in my book a little bit when I talk to some of the behavioral experts. You're, you're right. Like we're, we're laughing at it because people would, would, would look at you. And I don't yeah. know if you ever watched the episode Friends, but there's one of my favorite episodes. Uh, Phoebe, the character, she wants to go running with, with Rachel, but Phoebe runs like you did when you were a child, just arms all over. <laughs> Over and, and Rachel's very embarrassed running with her. And if we could sort of remove that barrier or this idea, who cares what people think? You know, if you were to yeah. just get down and do a few burpees while you're standing in line at the bank, of course, I'm not expecting that to happen, but, you know, at least maybe some vigorous shopping cart exercise as you're going to your car, maybe let's start there. Yeah. And if we all start doing it, it won't seem weird. <laughs> you know, the last point, and I don't want to get on the soapbox here, but, you know, back when I did travel <laughs> two years ago or so, <laughs> yeah. and I actually got on a plane, it always struck me, you know, people often are on planes for four, six, eight, 12 hours. Yeah. And then they get off the plane, they have a, a, a piece of, they have a load often their luggage or their, their pull cart. And of course, everyone selects the escalator. Whereas just if you were to just walk up the stairs with your luggage for 20 seconds there, that would provide so much benefit. But, you know, of course, many, you know, we're, we know that we're, we've evolved to uh, conserve energy, but, you know, just a very specific example of, of how we can incorporate it into our day. We've also evolved, sorry, to move as well, haven't we? You know, the way we sit for hours on end at the desk is not necessarily natural, I don't think, for humans. No, absolutely. On my reading list, I haven't gotten to it yet, but there's a new book by uh, Daniel Lieberman called Exercise, you know, why something we never evolved to do is healthy and rewarding. Um, so, you know, it, it's this idea of, as you allude to, we, we should be doing this, we know it's good for us, and, and why, uh, why don't individuals engage in it more? Yeah, well, the good thing about what you're doing is it's really removing the barriers. And if people understand that even small amounts are going to make a difference and cumulative over the day, then hopefully that will encourage people to, to move as much as they can. Yeah, because we know, you know, again, the public health guidelines are based on very good science, but depending on the survey, 75 or 80% of us are, are not listening. And so our approach is not to suggest we should scrap the public health guidelines, or sometimes you'll see these debates of interval mm. training versus traditional cardio. We talk about expanding the movement menu or the physical activity options that are available to people. And of course, in, in our studies and work around the world, we're trying to validate uh, the, the claims that are being made. So demonstrate that, yes, this type of brief, vigorous exercise will improve your fitness or mm. improve this health marker like insulin sensitivity. And so people know that the, the suggestions are, are, are grounded in good science and it complements what we already know about the benefits of um, more moderate intensity, continuous exercise. Mm. Well, there's two points that, that come to mind. There is one, the benefits of exercise go beyond, I think, just cardiovascular health, for example, because I think they have a very profound impact on your mental health. Absolutely. And there's examples of this. So uh, unquestionably, that is uh, true. And there's work looking at, for example, the relationship between fitness level and dementia risk. 
Uh, and we're learning more about that every day, the, the collective we in terms of exercise scientists. But mm. again, to give you a very specific example, some of the work of my colleagues at McMaster, they were looking at learning and performance on standardized tests in um, university age students. And they had a, a large class and they were able to allocate some students to do essentially exercise snacks or brief fitness breaks during the lecture. Another group took a break, but they weren't active. So they might look at their phone or jump wow. onto Facebook. And another group learned continuously through the lecture or sat through the lecture continuously. And what they found on standardized tests is that the student who had the, the activity breaks actually perform better. You know, and that mm. aligns with some other work looking at uh, overnight workers and their you know, productivity or performance. So you know, those are just examples of how productivity or performance on a test may reflect underlying brain health or function. Uh, but even if it's not a task at doing something, you just feel better when, you, when you're active. And the evidence is quite clear on that. Yeah. And even despite the evidence, I think most people just know, don't they? You don't need to read a scientific paper to know that you feel better when you move. Although, um, you know, in saying that, I am mindful of the fact that I, I think both of us are are dedicated experts and we're, we're talking to the converted at least into each other uh, yeah, here, of but some of my behavioral colleagues have, have pointed out, you know, I'm someone, if I am not active in the day or, you know, if say I have a whole series of meetings and that, and I'm just not able to be active, it, it's very frustrating, confining to me and my mood goes down uh, for some individuals just starting out. It's, it's the opposite. Right. And so that barrier, that feeling that I feel of, of not being active for some people just starting out, it's like getting over this, this huge mountain. And so again, if we can talk about breaking it up into smaller examples of that are, that are nonetheless effective. So don't start with 150 minutes a week, just start somewhere, yeah. set these subtle goals, know that you don't have to exercise for half an hour or an hour every day, start small, build from there. Uh, and there's evidence that that helps with people sustaining the activity uh, mm. or, or the, um, you know, the, 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 the way of the incorporating into their lives over the longer term. Yeah, actually, that's a very good point. Thank you for making that. So I said there were two things. The other thing is that I'd like to talk a bit about the actual health benefits and cardiovascular adaptions or sorry, physiological adaptions that happen when we exercise and we become fitter. So what, what happens to our bodies? Yeah, so the cardiovascular adaptation that you mentioned is a profound one. So literally what that means is your heart becomes a better, stronger pump. The heart gets bigger, it's able to fill with blood, and the pumping capacity goes up. So it's able to eject more blood with every beat. So literally it gets better at circulating the blood and oxygen through your body. Mm -hmm. There's changes in the lungs, your blood vessels get more elastic. So that allows the blood and oxygen to flow easier and your cells, uh, especially your muscle, but other cells as well, get better at using the oxygen to burn fuels like sugars and fats. And so that helps to control the fat levels in our blood. And it helps to control yeah. our blood sugar throughout the day, because literally you're increasing the rate and the capacity of your muscles to use those fuels. That's really interesting. And you talk about using the fuels. One of the things I know you have done is looked at interval training for people with chronic disease, for example, people with type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease. And that has been shown to benefit them reducing their blood sugar levels, for example, for type 2 diabetics. So obviously someone who is thinking about um, undertaking this needs to check with their medical professional first. But can you talk to us a little bit about what you've seen in patients with chronic disease who have undertaken some um, interval training? Yeah, so this was over a decade ago, we did our first study with individuals with type 2 diabetes. You know, we tend to do what we call small proof of concept studies. So these are not large scale randomized clinical trials, but in some of these early studies, you're just trying to establish the concept. And what we found was that older overweight individuals with type two diabetes. So these were clinically obese individuals with diagnosed diabetes in their sixties. They performed uh, two weeks of vigorous interval training. Uh, this was on a, a, on a reclining or recumbent cycle. Mm -hmm. And the exercise itself was 10 one minute efforts with a minute of recovery. So we're not talking a large commitment uh, and people after the two weeks, we found that their 
uh, blood sugar levels were markedly reduced. So they'd actually lowered their blood sugar levels. And we took a number of invasive measurements. We, we took biopsies of their muscles and we were able to show that the proteins in their muscles, the transporters, so literally the machinery that moves the sugar from the blood into the muscles was markedly increased. So the takeaway there is that first of all, these individuals were able to do the interval training uh, and that it was profoundly effective at improving one health related marker and literally changing the composition of their muscles and work like that now has uh, been replicated in, in labs yeah. uh, around the world and also applied to individuals with cardiovascular disease uh, and other uh, conditions as well, like metabolic syndrome. Well, that's really fascinating because you said that was a two week study. That's not very long. And to think that results were seen in such a short space of time, that's um, very encouraging. And also, I imagine, pretty motivating. Uh, you know, ab absolutely. And, you know, another idea with interval training is that it sort of can quickly reset your fitness. So if you can mm. get this quick boost, then perhaps other activities of daily living, maybe you're a little more encouraged to take the stairs or walk a little bit yeah. farther because frankly, it doesn't hurt as much. You know, it, you're, you're not uncomfortable being physically active. So uh, it, it, it's sort of a, a reset, if you will. Now, of course, there's lots of research needed on the behavioral side and does this allow people yeah. to sustain exercise over the longer term? Uh, but in short, you're right. It doesn't take a lot to rapidly improve your fitness. Mm, no, that's really, really great news. Um, Martin, I'd like to talk a little bit about athletes. You mentioned before that you were a triathlete and I've just done a race, uh, a half Ironman race or a 70.3 uh, in Cairns. So one thing I keep thinking about in, in terms of uh, interval training, and a lot of athletes do it, as you've already mentioned, is specificity. So, for example, if you want to run a marathon or do an endurance race, you don't swim laps in the pool, you run. And you're training yourself to be able to run for a long time. So you would think, okay, I need to do long runs. So where does high intensity interval training come into that kind of a training program? Yeah. So a couple points on that. I'll often say that, you know, or I'm asked the question, could you run a marathon based on just short, hard sprints? And my response mm. is, Yes, you probably could, oh, wow. but you're unlikely to run the best marathon that you have in you. <laughs> and so what right. I mean by that is, you know, the, the, the top coaches and athletes, as we mentioned, all of them utilize interval training as a component of their program. But the general rule of thumb for elite athletes or high trained endurance athletes is roughly 15 to 20% of their total training time is devoted to intervals. Now, of course, these in individuals are often training 30 hours a week. So even 15 or 20% is a significant component. Um, I'll also suggest that for mere mortals or serious weekend warrior type athletes, people are also holding down jobs, families, regular lives, and, and train much less in terms of the total volume. They can shift that. So maybe 30, 70, or even 40, 60. So I, I, I think the smaller the training volume, the higher the quality of training by incorporating some more uh, in intervals. Uh, but again, it comes back to what's the goal of the training uh, and uh, what's the capacity of the athlete. I can take 20 yeah. athletes and put them all in the same program. Some will thrive and some will wither. Yeah. No, it's interesting, isn't it? It sounds like interval training gives you a couple of things, bang for your buck. <laughs> And also it's a good thing to fit in, say you are busy working and juggling family and on a Wednesday you need to do some training, that is a good time to do your interval training rather than obviously your long, long run, for example. Yeah, so, exactly. It is a high yeah. quality training, but just like anything, you can probably do uh, too, uh, too much of it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so Martin, you've written a best-selling book, The One Minute Workout, Science Shows a Way to Get Fit That's Smarter, Faster, and short, Shorter. And you co-authored this with uh, Christopher Shulgin. So what it does is it translates the science of time-efficient exercise for health and fitness, what we've been talking about today. So what was your motivation for writing that book? It was an effort at science communication or you know, knowledge translation, as we call it, mm. this idea of breaking down what's often complex and conflicting science and putting it in a way that hopefully is accessible 
and also a compelling read for individuals who are interested in, in the material. And so my co-author, Chris Shogun, was a journalist, and we would try to get to the point where I was happy enough with the scientific message. You know, I was comfortable with the scientific yeah. message, and Chris felt it read in an accessible and again, hopefully compelling manner. But we had some real knockdown drag out fights yeah. over some of the passages there because I, I would say, no, no, we have to say this. And Chris would say, but that's boring. So we, we need to be able to present this in a way that people will, yes, understand, but hopefully, you know, enjoy reading as well. So it's not just a, a textbook that otherwise sits on a shelf. Yeah. Yeah, there's a real art, I think, to striking that balance because the layperson who's not a scientist wants to understand the science to a point, obviously, um, but they also want a bit of a story, you know, when they're, when they're reading. Mm. No, you're you're exactly right, and that that is an art and something I continue to work on, even in interviews like this, or try to. <laughs> and so, who is your intended audience of the book? Yeah, so people who are interested in health and, and fitness, but are clearly not experts. And, and so, for example, uh, you know, the New York Times Phys Ed Well column, that's a very popular column that Gretchen Reynolds writes. We we're thinking about individuals who might read that column, or of course, other individuals who are just broadly interested in physical activity, health, fitness, but they, they wanted a credible source of information mm. without having to go and try and read the science uh, themselves. So, so credibility of the book was, was quite important to us. Yeah, and I think there is a lot of noise out in the you know, health and wellbeing space, and I would say particularly in the nutrition space. So credibility is so important. That's great that that book is out there. If someone wants to buy a copy, what, what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah, so it was published by Penguin Random House, but uh, any of the major booksellers, including online, and I know it's available mm -hmm. in Australia through Amazon and some of the other major booksellers. Uh, and there's also an audio book uh, as, as well so that people could listen like a podcaster in their car. Oh, great. Who, who narrates that? Do you do that? or is uh, No, uh, <laughs> I thought I might get to do that, but there was yeah. someone who obviously had a better voice and uh, <laughs> the, the individual is, 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 is very good and actually is a audiobook expert. This is mainly what yeah. they do. So I think it's yeah, like these people, people that narrate that, the commercials. Yeah, they, they're, that is a job. Um, I'll put links in the show notes. And the other thing that you, you've you done um, that is also great if people want to learn more is you've done a course called Hacking Exercise for Health, The Surprising New Science of Fitness. And you've done this with your colleague, Professor Stuart Phillips. Uh, so tell us a bit about that course, um, where people can find it and what, what's in it, what they can expect to learn from that. Yeah, so this was a collaboration between my university, McMaster University, and the online learning platform. It's called Coursera. They're mm -hmm. uh, one of the major online learning platforms that produce these courses. The important thing is that all of the content there people can access for free. And so the content is primarily about 25 short videos lasting about five to 10 minutes each where Dr. Phillips and I try to break down some of the things that we've been talking about. Uh, Stuart is an expert in resistance exercise and nutrition, and I cover the cardiovascular side. And again, we try to do it sort of in a fun, accessible, compelling manner, but translate some of this science for, uh, for individuals. Now, you know, someone could get a certification by paying mm. a small fee and, and taking a few tests associated with a course. But the nice thing is that if you just want to learn a bit and access the content, it's entirely available to you for free. And so you could just Google hacking exercise for health, or I know you mentioned you'd put it in the show notes and, yeah. and people could access the content. Yeah, I'm partway through it. And I, I know there's someone special that appears in this course. So who's that? <laughs> that would be my mom. Uh, and so... <laughs> Uh, my mom is uh, 88 years old. She really practices some of the things that I talk about. Uh, and, you know, even a couple times a week, she does some uh, uh, air squats because I, she still lives independently in the, in the house uh, that I grew up in. And so she's a real inspiration to me and just a fun little episode where uh, it's my mom and I uh, breaking down some of the science. And, you know, she's a, a real example, I think, of that, uh, mm. you know, no matter your age, you can engage in, in interval training safely, effectively, and have a bit of fun with it. Oh, that's fantastic. I can't wait to get to that episode. I just wanted to ask you quickly also about, because I love triathlon, what's your favorite race distance? So I mainly raced international uh, distance. So the 1.5, mm -hmm. 40, 10. And, you mm. know, this is 
25 years ago. So that was the common distance at the time. And of course, subsequently sprint distances have come in and, uh, and, 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 and longer. So that was the main one that I, yeah. that I did. I never got up to a full uh, Ironman, quite, uh, quite daunting. So good on you for even doing a, a half. Very impressive. Have you got any aspirations to do that or? Regrettably now, in part because of uh, I, I had a running injury in college, oh, and so no. I tore my meniscus in my knee. So I'm one of those individuals who has classic knee osteoarthritis. The only thing I can't do is run. So I, I, I cycle a lot now. Uh, I can still swim, and I can even play ice hockey uh, because of the gliding motion. So regrettably not a runner anymore, but uh, certainly enjoy uh, cycling. That is exactly like my husband. <laughs> He did the same thing. He was a runner and he's um, his meniscus and all sorts of things are wrong with his knees. Um, the other thing I'm curious about is in Canada in the winter, it's obviously extremely cold and dark. How how and where do people, do people run? Do, what do people do if they oh. want to train? Oh, absolutely. I think, I think it's an old uh, finish or it's a Scandinavian expression that there's, there's no bad weather. There's only bad clothes. Uh, yes, and and it's that. great <laughs> because, <laughs> you know, if you dress properly, uh, you can exercise uh, all through the winter. And so certainly uh, people run all through the winter. There was a few seasons where I cycled to work all, all winter. Now I've become more of a fair weather cyclist. And so I think many people tend to move it inside uh, during the yeah. winter, but certainly runners, uh, people will, will run all winter. And of course, enjoy uh, the, the weather, you know, cross-country skiing, for example, is a yeah, very popular absolutely. activity. So you, you adapt to the circumstances, I think. Yeah. And there is some research now about cold exposure and the um, health benefits that has too. So I suppose um, getting yourself out into the elements probably has some, you know, it's probably good for, for you as well. Martin, to wrap up, I just wanted to ask you about what's happening um, in Canada in relation to COVID, and I'm wondering if that has impacted your work. It has. So uh, it, it, you know, like everywhere in the world and to different extents, it's it's been challenging. So Canada, I think, broadly speaking, reacted slowly and with half measures to start, and that meant we had uh, significant impact, but now we've been one of the more fortunate companies in that we're vaccinating a lot. And yeah. so now I think it's up to almost 70% of individuals in Canada have a single dose, uh, and about 20% have two doses already. So I, I think our finish will be better than our start. You know, in my sense from afar is in some ways, Australia is the opposite. You locked down hard, got it under control, yeah. but now vaccinations are, are, are falling behind. So uh, yeah. that, that in a nutshell, I think has been our experience. Hmm. I think what's happened over here is because we are, you know, we're an isolated place and the governments have been very strict with um, arrivals coming in and lockdowns. So there's been a sense, I think, that it's it's happening in other places. So I think the urgency to get vaccinated, it, it's not quite here. I was talking to a colleague yesterday who was sort of making that point that, you know, if you are largely staying domestic, the impact will be more muted than if you're looking to travel as a student or mm. obviously as someone else who's just interested. Uh, and just on, a, on the research, we've been prevented from doing human research for almost a year now, but actually just today, uh, I received approval that we can start to uh, conduct human-based research again, obviously cautiously and that, but it, yeah. it's had a very profound impact on the, the scientific uh, community and, and in particular, our, our, our trainees. Yeah, for sure. I think, I mean, that has happened to an extent here as well. Uh, a person I recently interviewed, uh, she said that her research was deemed essential. So she was allowed to keep um, doing her human trials, but not everyone's been in that position. So Martin, who inspires you? You know, she came up earlier, but I'll certainly mention my mom and, and you know, everyone loves your mom. But, uh, you know, my mom, who, who actually is an Aussie, by the way, she was uh, born ah. just outside of uh, Sydney. Oh, I like her already. So I have uh, many relatives uh, in, in and around primarily the New South Wales area. But, you know, she inspires me because, first of all, a ceaselessly positive outlook on on life. Uh, but she does a lot of the things she embodies a lot of things that we've we've talked about, you know, lifelong um, commitment to and it's really fitness. I don't think my mom would say mm. she's ever exercised in her life. 
but she's active. She walks almost mm. every day. She'll do these body weight exercises. Uh, and she has, you know, social circles of friends that help to maintain brain health and function. And so if I can, you know, get to the point where, where she is and still be living at a very high, high level, uh, you know, her, her, um, her mother was, was, was quite similar. So, um, my mom inspires me. Oh, that's great. She sounds amazing. And it sounds like you've got some good genes going on there too. So <laughs> you can thank her for that. <laughs> and the final question I like to ask all of my guests is if you could recommend two things that people could do to improve their well being, what would they be? Yeah, you know, it's given our talk, I, it's hard to beat being physically active. And again, yeah. this doesn't mean being a serious exerciser and changing into the lycra as we talked about, but physical activity is one of those things that it just is so all encompassing in terms of uh, being medicine for our body and mm. in, in for both physical and mental health. So that would be number one. And uh, number two would be, you know, if, if you're fortunate enough, meet a life partner who's always going to be there and in your in your corner when when things get tough and I've I've been certainly lucky to have that in uh, in my my wife uh, Lisa so uh, those would be the two. Yeah, oh that's great. It is nice to have someone you can confide in if you're lucky enough to have found that person. Martin, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time and um, all that really interesting and valuable information that you've shared with us. Thank you again, Amanda. It was a pleasure to speak with you. And that was Dr. Martin Gabala, Professor of Kinesiology in the Faculty of Science at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, and also the author of the one-minute workout, Science Shows a Way to Get Fit That is Smarter, Faster, Shorter. So Martin's research resonated with me because when it comes to exercise, I'm very much an all-or-nothing person. So if I can't do an, in quotes, proper workout, I'd do nothing at all. So now when I'm sitting at my desk for hours, I do take activity snacks. For example, I'll do some lunges while the kettle boils. And it's helped me because I now know that even small amounts of exercise spread throughout the day do add up and have a cumulative impact. Whereas before I might have just dismissed something like that as not helping me in the long run. So I found that very useful and I hope that you did too. If something in today's interview with Martin spoke to you, please do tell your friends about this podcast and share it with them. And if you could take a minute to leave a rating on Apple Podcasts, it will help people find my podcast and I really do appreciate that. If you would like to subscribe to Vibrant Lives Podcast, you can subscribe on all good podcast providers like Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio and you can also subscribe on YouTube. Please follow me on Instagram at vibrant underscore lives underscore podcast. If you'd like to contact me and suggest topics or people to interview, you can DM me or you can contact me via my website on the contacts page at www.amandaswellbeingpodcast.com. Thank you so much for tuning in today and please don't forget to share the podcast. Have a great day and eat well, move well. Think well.